why we're doing this project, why I'm even here, <laughs> how I came to be here. It'll be quick, I promise. Um, and then I want to run through our community engagement process, which is the five-month-ish process that we are just concluding for the most part today and, and this week. And in a couple of months, we will submit our final, our final summary of that process to the city. Um, and then I want to talk about what the next steps are with the outcome measurement system moving forward. Because this is just a milestone in our project. This is not the end. And in fact, we are not even sharing with you our final results from our community engagement process today. I'm giving you a sample, and I'm sharing with you the structure. Because we really, truly believe that you all need to tell us if we're, in, if we're, if we're headed in the right direction. So we're going to share si significant, interesting pieces, I hope. And I'm also going to ask you to give us feedback and say, does, if we do it in the way that we have described, does it deliver value? Is it continuing to move our process forward? Or do you have different recommendations? Because we have another two months of working on the report to integrate additional feedback. And so that's why we wanted to come to you early before the final, that final phase of that report is written. Um, so that's our plan for today. We'll see how we do. And what kind of consultant would I be if I didn't start with a quote? Um, this is, this green, this is the official Santa Monica green on my screen, I just want you to know. It looks very different, uh, projected. Um, this green is really tough. Uh, Greg, maybe you could bring down the house lights a little bit. Um, that might help a bit, but the white on green, I apologize for that. So, is that a little better? Okay, okay. Um, so this is from Cliff Stoll, who's a, an old tech guy. Um, data is not information. Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding, and understanding is not wisdom. And I think that that's really important as we begin projects like this to acknowledge that the data only answers the questions we know how to ask. It can only tell us what, what we get, what we ask it to do. It's not going to give us some divine answer that we can know is right because it came from the data. We are as human when we work with data as anything else, and we, need, we make mistakes. And that's OK because we're learning as we go, hopefully. And as we transform data into information and hopefully into knowledge that we can train each other on and develop it into practice, it becomes understanding. And unfortunately, I don't have a shortcut to wisdom. Um, that just comes with time, I suspect. Um, as I, I don't know that I said this to the room, um, we probably won't use the, the official Q&A that I built into the slide deck. So if you have questions at some point, we're a small enough group, just raise your hand. Um, I may ask you to use a microphone, again, for your, the audience at home, um, assuming there is one. I don't actually know if anybody's watching. but. Um, uh, I've been told we have to speak into the microphone so that they can hear us. So I'll put that there in case we end up using it. So my team was hired uh, about two and a half years ago, I think, um, to look at how do we look across the portfolio of the Human Services Division of the City of Santa Monica's Human Service Grant Program, HSGP, to understand how could we use technology to answer some of the questions about are the projects that the city's funding performing in the way that folks expect it to when we write a check to an organization or they submit a grant application or we partner with them like a county agency or somebody like that is the project doing the thing we think it should do and early on we had an opportunity to share with the whole team and say um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of consensus in the field of social services around what success is. And that was part of where we started our project, to say that, um, and I'll give you a few examples, um, in the area of education, for example, and we've been doing education in our country for hundreds of years as a formal thing. Um, if you ask five principals, or five teachers in your life, if you know them, um, what is the outcome 
what is the successful outcome of a good education? My guess is you will get five different answers. You might get six. Um, <laughs> we don't have a common lexicon or a, co a common language around what success is for education. We have lots of very reasonable definitions of success. You could say, oh, you went to, uh, you got into college, great, that's a successful high school education. Or you could say, great, you got trained in HVAC and plumbing, that's a successful education. But if you're using the definition of our college prep program and measuring a vocational technical program with that same standard, it doesn't look like it's succeeding. And vice versa, if I took the vocational technical program and applied that standard to our college prep, let's say upon graduation you can get a job making $60,000 a year. Well, our college prep program that's designed to matriculate to college won't be making that much money anytime soon, um, and certainly not while they're in university. And so it's important as we have these conversations that we acknowledge there has to be a level of consensus building. Because as I said, education we've been doing formally for hundreds of years in our country. You can imagine um, other disciplines that are not as well developed still have these kinds of debates. And so that was where our project started the conversation is to say, we have to come to some agreement about how we're going to measure this portfolio before we can turn on all the thermometers and, and the different measurement tools to decide if it's working. Because if you know you're going 40 miles an hour, that's great. But if you don't know if you're going forward or backwards, that's problematic. And so, as, and again, these are not gaps that are unique to Santa Monica. In fact, they are common across the country. This is a common experience that communities have as they look now, for the first time, many communities are able to look across these services in a unique and different way as the technology tools have begun to be in integrated into social services. Uh, for those of you who have been involved with social services, you know for a long time, I can remember getting in debates with nuns about why are you taking my money for a computer? I need a bed for this person, not a computer. And, and they would f say, here's my index card file. You can go do with it what you want about how to measure whether our shelter is working. And which, uh, a fair evolution of our approach. But it is only in the last 10 years as technology has been begun to be more thoroughly integrated and has become an acceptable thing to fund that we have begun to be able to have the insight. So our project was, is, original, is tasked with an outcome measurement system that collects the most relevant data on project performance to improve data-driven policy making. That's the goal of our project. So if I've gotten to ask many of you what your definition of success is, this is my definition of success for me and my team. Um, and where we've been with this project, we started our community engagement with executive directors of all the agencies that HSGP funds. And HSGP, again, the Human Services Grant Program, is about $8 million a year. So it's not an insignificant amount of money. Um, and it funds all sorts of things, really from, from birth through retirement to end of life stuff. It starts with childhood subsidies for infant daycare because we know how important um, those developmental years are and that deficits in those years impact somebody for the rest of their life. And we also know that many of us need support as, we, as our vulnerability increases as we age and we need some more support around access to healthy food or transportation or um, making sure we don't get isolated. Yes? How was that number? Eight, Eight million. It's about 90,000. It's about 8.3 square miles. Yeah. It's about 8.3 8 square miles is the geography of the city. Yeah. Luckily, it's not the only money in our services. So Santa Monica is part of the county of Los Angeles and the state of California. Now, that is a trade-off. <laughs> Comes with strengths and it opens up vulnerabilities. 
that we then have to address. And I think being part of that, um, being as strategic as we can about how do we spend the piece that we have control over as a team is critical to making sure we leverage everything we can to get more money, to your point, if possible. Um, so our community engagement process uh, really is running through our report, which will come, um, we'll submit to the team um, in winter, uh, at the beginning. Uh, you may remember, if you were in one of my sessions, we said October originally. This is a little bit later, and I'm gonna talk about why. Um, and then this is culminating with an, um, a new approach to an RFP, a request for proposal, in the fall of 2020. So your city council passed uh, an amendment to the program to give a few additional years for this approach to finish and ap approach the funding from a different perspective. And so one of the questions I've got asked several times in this conversation with the community was, does, does this feel like lip service? Is our city just doing this to feel like it's doing it? And what I've said consistently is in communities that are taking that approach, where they feel like they have to perform the dance of caring, they don't, the city council doesn't come near things. <laughs> they don't want a vote in those communities. And so the commitment of your community, the changes, how engaged your community has been really from your, the leaders of your community to your partners, to the service providers, um, those are not components that exist in communities that are endeavoring to do these things to check a box, in my experience. And so that's the answer I have given consistently every time I've been asked. Um, now there's a significant period of time between this community engagement process and the interdepartmental RFP, and we're gonna talk today about what it is that we're doing during that time frame. Um, but I wanna circle back to that idea of success. I know that some of you kind of probably perk up when I say, well, we don't have concurrence on what success is in human services. Like, what do you mean? How could we not know? Um, this is an article from the New York Times a few months ago uh, from a transplant surgeon that was talking about the definition of success in transplants. That apparently this, and I didn't know until I read the article, but I'm gonna talk like I knew it. Um, apparently there was not a common, there is not a common definition of what it means to have a successful organ transplant that each part of the hospital and each part of the healthcare system is measured against a different standard. That the, the heart failure team cares that you get to the hospital to get the transplant. The surgeon cares that you, got, you survived the operating room and got back to your hospital room. The nursing staff cares that you leave the hospital room. The occupational therapists and physical therapists care that you get back to your life. And none of that incorporates what I, as the heart transplant survivor, care about, which is, can I go back to my life? Can I play with my kids? Can I go to my job? That's not built into any of those metrics. And so you, you know we spend way more than $8 million on healthcare in our country. If they are still having this conversation, I want that to give some room to say, it's okay that we are also having this conversation and learning some of that same practice. We have not in social services invested nearly the amount of money that the healthcare industry has in metrics and technology and the mastery of practice. You think about all the different licensures that exist just for nursing. Um, you know, you start as a certified nursing assistant and then you move your, can move your way up to be a nurse practitioner and prescribe medication and all the steps in between. Um, we have some, some components of that and some clarity, but not to that degree because we've made different choices. So I talked about definitions of success. This is, these are the definitions of success that were in place when we started. This came from the great team at the Human Services Division, the analytics folks there. Um, the grant program had 479 outcomes listed in it for 42 programs. That is a huge number of outcomes. Huge. That would be huge in a city four times your size, 10 times your size. That would be huge. To the idea that we could measure that 
take the outputs, the, the information that it gave us, and weave it back into our practice in a substantive way is unsustainable. And so this is where we're starting. And again, this is not uncommon, this vision, because as we don't make while we don't make investments across our service system, we have lots of partners in the delivery of human services that do make these investments. You think about the Boys and Girls Club of America as a good example. While they have a national outcome model that they as the Boys and Girls Club hold every chapter to. And it is about achieving the vision of the Boys and Girls Club, which is totally appropriate. But it's not tied to any specific component that we are focused on here in Santa Monica. And so if we've designed our funding to complement their funding, they may be bringing their outcome measures into our grant portfolio. Again, probably not unreasonable <laughs> that they're doing that. These are probably pretty uh, standard and uh, necessary um, measures. But even small changes to the language can mean we're not really collecting the same thing. And so if I change even the way I construct um, gender. So some data systems ask what a participant's sex is, and some data systems ask what a participant's gender is. And for uh, somebody who doesn't do this work every day, you may think, oh, well, those are pretty much the same thing. They're not. We know that folks who are transgender are dramatically overrepresented in folks who experience homelessness. We know that LGBT kids experience homelessness many times the rate of their peers. And so acquiring that information is helpful if we're trying to make investments that appropriately engage those issues. But even again, small changes in the question can end up in this scenario. And so it's exciting to be in a community that's so interested in this topic and has a lot to work with and, and craft as we come to some consensus around what we're doing. Now, if there were 150 people in this room, this is where I would say, go on to Slido, and da 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 But we're not 150 people. So does anybody have any questions about anything I just covered? Yes? So lovely colored sheet. Yeah. I'm not, because this is really looking backwards. Um, and uh, I'm, that, I couldn't have planted a better question than that to give this answer. Um, we, I, when I conducted these facilitated sessions, I said very clearly to everybody, I have no authority <laughs> and I can only make recommendations. And our conversations were very much forward looking, that this is about what is the vision for what we want and to the degree that our experience looking backwards informs what we want to change and do differently, it's helpful. But to the degree that we're reconciling some past grievance, this is not the forum for that. And, and I know that's not the question you were asking, but it peaked my head. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Yes. We went with the ones that were funded by the portfolio. Okay. Oh, that one. All of those yes, they were all invited. What's the number of them? Uh, I can tell you the number of programs, but each program doesn't equate to a specific agency. I could give you an approximation. It's about 20 agencies, but I do have the data for you. Okay. And afterwards, I'll keep a running list, and any data element points you would like, I'm happy to share with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, for, I forgot our audience at home. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There we go. Okay. So a couple of points um, as we move forward in our discussion. We're going to review the process of community engagement and talk big picture. And then I'm going to share with you guys how our team has started to group the feedback, the analysis that we have done to begin to shape the structure of the report and ask that you weigh in. I often get the question, what if I disagree with you? What if I don't like the way that you've grouped it? 
great, give us another way. This is not calculus, this is not physics. There's not an answer that works everywhere in the country. There's the answer that we all decide on. So I can give you lots of metrics, I can give you lots of attributes, I can give you lots of data about how we want to shape things, but there are projects that cross lots of boundaries in terms of the practice, the services that they do, how they're envisioned, how they work collaboratively in the community, and it is not always like a, a program, I'll give you an example, an education or a, count, a counseling program based in a high school that's targeting youth who are experiencing homelessness. Is that a youth program, is that a homeless program, or is that an education program? It's all three, really. Um, and, and any of those answers is fine. Again, as long as we agree, we're measuring it using the same yardstick, or we're acknowledging that we're gonna use the therapy yardstick instead of the educational attainment yardstick. All fine. So if you disagree, there are a couple of ways you can disagree. One, there are demographic forms that were on the desk when you walked in. You're welcome to fill them out if you'd like. You're welcome to not fill them out if you don't want to. And on the bottom of those forms is an opportunity to give us your email and write your questions and we will get back to you. That is one way. The other way is this, uh, can you see this email in the bottom right corner? Cannabinproject.smgov.net. That's a, an email address that goes to my whole team, so everybody sees the feedback um, and incorporates it. And then there's also a survey, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, that's been up since we started our community engagement process that's on the Human Services Division's website. So, and I'll put that link up at the end so you can snap a picture of it or, or write it down if you'd like. So if you disagree or you missed your opportunity to join the conversation, those are ways you can formalize your comments to make sure they're in the written record if you're feeling like um, you want to make sure that your particular feedback is memorialized in a particular way. Okay, so what did we do? This is my colleague, Lindsay, who's going to be mortified that I'm broadcasting a picture of her. Um, as you walked in, you saw those cards that were uh, beautifully arrayed on the umbrella. Uh, the umbrella's outside. Those cards, for those of you who came to our sessions, you know exactly what they are, but for those of you who didn't, each card is meant to be a single idea. And the question that we asked everybody who joined us, well, we asked three different, slightly different questions, but the question was generally, what does an effective human service system look like to you? And the idea is that it looks different to everybody. That if you are a counselor who's funded, whose full-time position is funded by the grants program, an effective human service system may look different than uh, a youth who comes to uh, one of our projects for support, which dif looks different than a community member who's really doesn't have an, hasn't had an opportunity to have close contact with any of our funded projects. So that they're really looking at a different part of the community and saying, I'll know this is effective when X happens. And so each card, you can kind of see here on the bottom right, each table worked with um, their table to develop a set of cards. And then they go up on our magic sticky wall and which you now have two of here in the city of Santa Monica if you want to use them for your own facilitation exercises. Um, and the room works to group them. So these groupings that you saw outside, those are not groupings that my team did. Those are groupings that your community did. We had meetings that were school social workers. We had meetings that were educational leaders in the community. We had meetings that were city leaders. We had meetings that were program participants. We had meetings that were the general public. Um, we had all sorts of meetings with all sorts of folks to produce these cards and then group them. And each group then gets a name. So you can kind of see that one at the top. Oh, maybe you can see that one at the top. Um, that group, this group here, was all different ideas that different tables came up with and then decided they all, the room working together, decided they belonged together. And at the end of grouping them, they came up with the name. 
of what is that group called? Why is it a group? What about it makes it a group? And now I love that card, actually. That's part of why I used it in my sample, because the group was supports ambitious efforts, which I think is a great answer to what does an effective human service system look like. It should support ambitious efforts. And again, these are not my words. This is not my analysis. These are the, this is the language. Yes, my team does facilitate. Absolutely, that's our job, to make sure we get something. But um, this can, comes out of our process here. Um, and one of the pieces, and I'm drawing attention to this only because I said I would circle back to it, uh, a feedback that we got was more advanced notice, better outreach for community meetings, in parentheses, like this one. And I want to draw everybody's attention to the incredible pivot that the city and the team did of moving the dates of our original conversation like this uh, more than 30 days based on this request. And you saw way more signage and Facebook and posters. And that is a, an impressive pivot for any organization to get feedback, integrate it, and move forward with it. And I want to recognize that that came out directly out of this process, and they did an amazing job. Yes? I was just going to say, like, when you were saying they moved the deadline, how were those things? Which things? So how did people know to show up? How did, how did people know to show up for that other, the previous slide, to we, do those we did things? did a few of the things that we did for this meeting, and, and are getting better at it as we go. So invitations went out. Um, we also, when we met but with- in, How were invitations distributed? They went out over next door, over Facebook, over email. They went out in flyers to all of our, pro, all of our funded projects. They went out to colleagues in the professional space. So colleagues emailed each other. Um, and I'm sure I have a list of other functions that we did, and I, I'm happy to share it with you, but that generically is. I guess what I wanted to know was what was the diff if you're saying this was a dramatic pivot, what changed from I think be before this to, to then uh, what current, what was the change? I think we were able to focus more specifically, and I think that's largely what a lot of this feedback is. It's not, as we go through, we can keep talking about it, but, um, being able to focus clearly and say our community asked us to do this in this way helps to give clarity to a topic and helps to say this is important and let's do it and draw resources in this way. So I, um, I, I just think that's an important, that's why I wanted to draw attention to it, that and that we're late on purpose. We didn't, we didn't slip it by accident. It was an intentional choice that was made. Yes, did you have a question? I would recommend since we're measuring the next thing to try to hear. Yep. Yep. Measure the systems. Shouldn't you be measuring the timeline you got that yep. for your own system? You yep. should know when that was printed or written, and you should know everything that was done to follow that timeline yep. as your own example. Yep, I agree, and I do know that. So I'm happy to share that information. That's okay, I appreciate the feedback. Absolutely. So the question, again, that we asked most rooms was, what does an effective human service system look like to you? And we got three kinds of answers, according to my team. So this is when our analysis is starting. So I'm, I'm game for as much criticism as you want, starting now. Um, specific activities or services. So this was answers that were, you should do this. We need more this. We want this. And again, we were not looking backwards in terms of reconciling some fault or flaw. We were looking forwards in terms of what we want. And, and this, by and large, is outside of the purview of our project. It's incredibly valuable information, and we need it to be successful in our project, and I'm gonna talk about how these all interconnect. But you have lots and lots of decision makers who inform what services you as the city of Santa Monica fund, how much of those services, and what it means to be delivering that service. 
That is not, and that's why I started with that, I don't have any authority comment. Uh, there are lots of mechanisms for making those decisions, and we can help, and where we have expertise is looking at programs like domestic violence shelters, or school-based mental health counseling programs, or infant daycare subsidies, and saying, here's how the Department of Health and Human Services recommends you f measure that system, here's where the connection points are in the thing you're currently doing, and here's how we would recommend that be woven in, and that information will be in what we submit to the city, but we don't, we're not in a position to say you need to double this and have that and that's success, because that was not what we were asked to do, nor would folks be happy if I came back with that answer. The second piece, the second of three types of answers that we got. Uh, I want to move my computer, but it's a very fragile connection up here, so I apologize that it's in the way here. Um, was about skills and knowledge. So this was about what does it mean? I think all of our social workers should be multilingual. I think we should credential all of our early childhood daycare providers to a certain level. I think whatever and we're gonna go through some of the samples of the types of feedback that folks gave, but that that generally was about skills and folks' mastery of those skills. And again, we have lots of evidence, there's lots of research available in the country around how do you measure a particular approach. So this may be two in the weeds, but there, there are lots of different kinds of case management that you can use. There are different models. One sample in the field is called critical time intervention, um, and it has a very specific definition and it includes certain things. And there's another model called assertive case management, which has different questions and different things. And they're intended to achieve different goals. But if you're not somebody who knows a ton about case man, even people who know a ton about case management often don't, aren't well-versed in these different models because it's not super relevant to the day-to-day -day delivery of case management services in a community. As a case manager, you are often there to accomplish a goal and whatever tools you need to accomplish that goal, you use. And it doesn't matter what they're called. Um, and so the second kind of feedback that we got was about skills and knowledge. And again, we see that, yes, connected and adjacent to our work, because if we are measuring success and understanding outcomes, we need to understand the inputs into the system. So if we are plugging PhD or, or MD psychiatrists into um, a role that as shelter, frontline shelter workers, for example, well, that's a choice. <laughs> that's a lot of skills and a lot of education to bring to that job. Um, we're not doing that. That was an example, just to be 100% clear. Um, oh man, that green is gonna kill me throughout this presentation, I'm sorry. I will change that for Monday. So if you wanna come back Monday, the green will be different. Um, but measuring and understanding outcomes, which is what our team was hired to do, is how do we look at this current portfolio and identify the, the intent? What, what are we trying to accomplish and how do we measure it in an interdependent way to recognize, as your point earlier, we are a small slice of the pie, and we, which means we have to be diligent and strategic and pull in as many parts of the connections as we can. And, and this is something that all of the communities that surround you are also doing now. As you look at the movements in LA County and the movements of the state of California, both of those organizations are trying to become more nimble at this. Um, and so we very much, this is, our, this is our lane, this is my team's lane, this is what we see as, as right, the, the kinds of information that were super relevant. So what did we do? So this is an example of a column. The title of the column is at the top. Again, that came from the room. Uh, that's my poor handwriting at the top there. It says layered and transparent accountability. So that was what this room felt like this column represented. Um, and it's hard for me to read the cards sometimes. So what we did was start to code them. 
And this says service providers truly held accountable. Failure is accepted as part of the process. Person-centric measures of success, and in parentheses it says consumers, serves everyone who comes to the door. We're not going through all 900 cards, don't worry. Um, employees with like circumstances, mirrors in parentheses, tracks diverse hiring processes of all employees, ongoing survey slash testimonial process, interventions meet sequential needs. That was a tricky idea, so that one got a triple color. Um, so this is the beginning of our coding of these ideas. So the, the ideas that were tied to a specific type of service or volume of service got coded with the red color. The ideas that are about mastering particular skills or measuring a practitioner's knowledge of their discipline got our blue color. And the ideas that were about measuring the outcome got the green color. And you can see, for those of you who went through this process, you know we were pretty rigid about one idea per card. And now you can see why, that when even with very straightforward seeming language, we can end up with complex ideas. Like this bottom one, interventions meet sequential needs. That's a, there's a lot there that we could, we could spend a whole day just talking about that idea. That needs occur in a likely order given particular vulnerabilities or attributes of a person as you move through life. So if you start life in one place, with one body, with one set of genetics, with one set of experiences, your trajectory looks like one direction, and if you start with a different set, it looks in a different direction. And potentially, we have the data to make some reasonable predictions about those trajectories. But do we have the interventions to do anything with that is a separate question. So that's why that quest, that card got coded with all three colors because there's a lot there and we're not trying to mask the complexity. We want to bring it out but also accurately report what we've done. The, I mentioned there was a slight variance on the question. We varied the question in two ways with two different groups. The first way we varied it was with our executive directors. The question that we asked them is in the bottom left-hand corner here. How can an outcome measurement system support your most important work? So this was 40-ish executive directors with us for about two hours, and we had a lot to cover. They spent about 45 minutes developing this board. Is that a very long yep, it sure is. <laughs> HSD's website. I'll put the website up at the end. But yep, all of the cards have been scanned and all of and the organization captured. We have pictures, we have structures like this. All of these slides will be up after my presentation. So all of this is available. And that was super important to our team, that you be able to trace the throughput from the beginning to the end. Because community involvement, accountability, transparency, uh, verifiability, Auditability, these were all features that came up in lots of conversations. So the question again, we asked the, these folks was slightly different. And what we did was go through and code every card. So every card gets a color and we take that idea and move it forward to the next step in the process, which is structuring these ideas in a way that let my team focus on the part that is immediately relevant to our next step and we're gonna talk about pilot outcomes in a few minutes, and deliver to the city and say, we also got lots of great things that we're not gonna use right now. We might pick them up in our step afterwards, but it is valuable information that may help you all make some decisions as you move forward. So we didn't wanna lose any of that. So we've coded every card and transmitted all of them to the city. We're gonna do this a little bit faster because it would be slow watching. Um, uh, and you will see some of the cards had heavy, kind of leaned heavily in one direction or another. 
Sometimes that's because we had lots of service providers in the room. Sometimes it's because we had uh, youth in the room. So this one is a youth card. And I told you we varied in two different ways. One question was for our executive directors. This one was for youth. So this was ages 10 to 14. And we did a couple of these sessions. One session, we didn't do a board because we had a small enough group of youth that it felt like that would get in the way of the conversation. And so we didn't produce a board like this. We produced a written log of that communication. We did that two other times, and I'm happy to talk about why we make those decisions and, and what we do with the data. Again, we have pictures of everything and, that we produce, and it's all available. The question we asked the kids, excuse me, the youth, was what helps you to be resilient? Because for many of us, that's part of the, a significant part of the definition of human services, is it enhances your individual ability to be resilient, to withstand shocks, whether those are financial shocks, mental health shocks, um, uh, health, whatever the shock is, that resilience and human services help you to interconnect and withstand those shocks. Um, so we're going to do this faster and faster. And again, these are all available online. So I'm here to give you the structure of our thinking and ask you to tell us and my team, are we missing something? Did we, are we organizing this in a way that doesn't feel useful to you? Are we doing something that feels problematic or misses the mark? Do you want to make sure something is incorporated in terms of how we evaluate these? Um, those are the kinds of questions that I am looking for from this conversation. Um, I know many of you may come to the room with your own sets of questions, which are fine. Again, we'll get you as much data, probably more data than you really want, um, about our process and everything and moving forward. Um, but no matter how fast these go, they still take a little while. <laughs> um, any questions on our process or anything that we've done up till now? I never know whether an absence of questions is a sign of success or failure. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I'll take success then. <laughs> um, this one came from our most dynamic meeting, uh, which was 52 members of the general public uh, at uh, a meeting, a uh, social service commission meeting which was our biggest group uh, of all. We saw several uh, hundred people through this process, which was very neat. Um, as I mentioned, we saw social workers, teachers, school-based mental health clinicians, street outreach workers, folks. We did a great session at Sam O'Shell. Um, we worked with um, executive directors, as I mentioned. Everybody really had an opportunity to weigh in on this process so that we really start with a universe of information that comes from your community. Because this, we can bring you an answer to some of these questions from outside, from other communities, from Boulder, from New York City, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, from wherever, but folks do not want an answer from another place that looks different, that has different features, that is has different histories that has different resources, different options that are or are not available. Um, and as I mentioned, these are, phew, that's the last one. Um, this is not calculus or physics. There's not one right answer. These interconnect and are ideas that sit adjacent to each other. As I said, if we go back to an idea of if we're funding a program where the staff are compensated at a certain level and you need to have 15 years of education, like a psychiatrist does, then we would have a certain expectation about the kinds of things that person does. We would expect psychiatry outcomes from that. If we're going to use that much money to acquire that resource, we expect that skill to deliver a particular thing. We don't expect psychiatrists to say, I gave out 50 referrals today. That we can pay a lot less money and get that kind of answer. And so while these are similar, while these are not directly on point to what we're trying to do, these ideas are interdependent. 
And so I just wanted to run through, again, because this is not, I'm not trying to stand up here and give you an accounting, a double entry bookkeeping of every card of every session. I'm trying to give you a flavor of what we did so that you can understand what kind of report we're submitting to the Human Services Division and help us craft that report to, say, to make sure it does the thing you want to do. So these were the, a few samples of the kinds of cards that got coded red. And these are real answers from different sessions. And I'll talk a little bit about why they're coded red, because I, it's not always clear. Better engage businesses was an answer that we coded red because that's a very particular activity. Going to the downtown development meeting, going to the planning and zoning board meeting, going to wherever. That's a very significant investment of somebody's time that has to be reasonably skilled at doing that thing to expect anything out of it. You can't send even a credentialed social worker they don't learn, they're not there, they don't go to school to learn economics and economic development and, and all those things. They go often to learn uh, either clinical practice or macro systems practice. And so as we think about better engaged businesses, while that can seem like a straightforward thing, that's a whole profession. There's a whole discipline and work that gets done around that idea. And so that went in the bucket called activities and services because it's a decision that your community get, should make around what does it want to do. And there's, again, not a right answer. There's the answer that we all agree it should move forward. And maybe when you contrast that, one of our youth talked about how much he liked the music studio, that it gave him time to be himself and clear his head. And we can't take that answer and say, well, we should put music studios at every high school. Or maybe we can. That's your choice. But these are the kinds of answers that got coded red as service decisions. And we can offer our analysis of the types of things that that type of service does, but we're not going to spend a huge amount of the report talking about what, what is the service structure that you should all put in place. Again, there's lots and lots of inputs to that kind of process. Sports, we got lots of sports answers from youth. Um, affordable housing, we got, I almost wrote this 15 times on the screen. <laughs> when we asked people, what does an effective human service system look like in Santa Monica? We got the answer, housing, often, very often. And just to be 100% clear, housing is its own department in the city of Santa Monica structure. The way the government is, the systems are organized here, there's a Department of Housing and Economic Development, which is separate and apart from the Department of hum the Division of Human Services within uh, Community and Cultural Services. Yes, do you have a question? Oh, no, okay. Um, and so when we think about what that helped to reveal to me is that many people are looking at the resource called human service and expecting a housing outcome. But our housing resources are in a different group. Yes, there's crossover. We have very highly skilled street outreach workers who exist in that orbit of housing, obviously. And you have that great research study from Rand recently that talks about what a good investment that was for your city to make. That's outstanding. That, though, is separate from the organizations that control the eligibility criteria, the structure, the volume, the nature of housing resources. And so that's, that's a separate thing. Local psych resources, we hear this a lot, and I know there are a couple of projects going on um, around uh, developing additional beds for folks who are struggling with a psychiatric crisis. And we want additional practitioners who can meet the need, the folks' mental health needs across the community in Santa Monica, from our youth to our families to our elders to individuals experiencing homelessness, that folks felt like there needed to be more of this. So that came up. Address causes, not symptoms. Again, this is a specific activity. There's a whole approach to analyzing problems called root cause analysis. But when you get a root cause analysis answer, if you're not ready, 
<laughs> to do something with that answer, you could be really stuck because those are big answers. Those are answers like capitalism, democracy. <laughs> um, and so when we think about would we want to invest our resources here, maybe we would. Maybe we wouldn't do a root cause analysis. Maybe we would look at a different part of the structure or use a different approach. But again, that's a decision your community makes. It's not up to us. Job training for gainful employment. And I put this up here on purpose because there is a, a lot in that, in that fragment. Um, gainful employment means a specific thing. It means that I can sustain myself and my household. So job training doesn't, for gainful employment, the standard that is set for me when I read that is I should be able to sustain my household in this community. And there are lots of standards for measuring that. You could look at the deprivation index that the US Census Bureau does. You could look at the American Community Survey that the Census Bureau does. You could look at the housing wage that the National Alliance to End Homelessness does for every geography in the country. There are lots and lots of resources that would help you decide what the amount of income you would need to define gainful employment is. And then there's lots of research around job development, economic development, workforce training, all of that's again a whole system a whole structure and it would probably involve santa monica college it would involve our partners from across that um, service sector which is normally in most parts of the country run at the county level and federal resources here are also invested at the county level so that's a county service of which you are a part of so that would have its own um, its own implication of where you invested your resources Fund small and large crisis intervention. This was an interesting one too. The idea that we need very, very flexible funds. And again, this is not looking backwards and saying we don't have it. It's looking forwards and saying, what do we need? I happen to know your community does lots of this stuff. And so that's great. Um, skills and knowledge was that second bucket that again, while it sits adjacent to our work, we don't see it as right in our lane. And so uh, a couple of examples, um, I liked this one, it was pretty straightforward but super complicated. Makes voting on budget easier. Which I thought was, it. initially I, I was like, eh, that feels silly. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized like, wouldn't it be great if you arrived at the point where it was time to vote and it was easy because everybody knew the information and we, we'd gotten to that point together. Um, and so I, I, I like that idea. But again, that's about skills and knowledge. That's about developing folks to engineer that process to execute that vision, not what we're, our team is focused on with this project. Shared value and, ex and clear expectations. So building shared values and designing program portfolios and programmatic infrastructure around shared values, absolutely, you have lots of that in place in lots of different areas. We exist in different communities that share values all the time. Um, and how we train our staff to be clear is uh, about mastering that topic. Um, Trauma-informed and culturally humble. I thought that was a really interesting one too. I also am not quite sure how you measure culturally humble, um, but I like the idea, I'm on board. Um, Trauma-informed, on the other hand, has a very clear definition. Trauma-informed care is an approach to interacting with people that recognizes that we all come to these interactions with trauma. And, and that brings and makes me as a person sensitive in different ways than it makes you sensitive. And that we need to communicate with each other in a way that is informed by that idea. And this is particularly true in when you have a, a power dynamic between a service provider and a service participant. That the service provider is the authority and is often in a much more stable place from a structural perspective than the person who's coming for help, or at least in that moment. Your doctor may be struggling with a divorce or everything, but when you go to see the doctor, you want your doctor to just 
be a doctor. <laughs> um, so, but bringing trauma-informed care, again, not our call. You all as a community may make a decision that every city employee should be trauma-informed. Great, that will have a very clear implication on your budget. Not our lane, not what we're focused on. Understanding patience and compassion for others. These are measurable things. This was an interesting answer. It came up in lots of different ways. We heard about kindness. We heard a lot about the community wanting to help. But I don't know how. I want to engage. I want to contribute. But I don't, I feel like I can't. I feel like I may make a mistake, that I may make somebody more vulnerable, that I may make myself vulnerable to something. And so this was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of feedback that was related specifically to that, which is uh, outstanding. You want your community to feel connected and want to help. Um, figuring out what bridges that gap and lets folks feel like they can is part of the answers that you all, um, as we move forward, work on. Multilingual, again, has a very specific definition. You all get to make a decision about do you want to deploy multilingual staff or not in particular positions? Well-trained has a very specific definition, a criteria for a position, knowledge, skills, and abilities define an employment position, and your capacity to align with those or not is the, the metric. Providers that are knowledgeable serving specific populations, um, now we move into the ideas that are, and I'm gonna stop after the slide and ask you some questions, so start to get ready. Um, uh, measuring the outcome. This is the part that we see in our lane. Um, these were measurable things, outcomes that the community was looking for, and we can assemble those outcomes in a way, in a narrative structure that makes sense and a measurement structure. So no veteran left behind has a specific meaning in terms of what kind, what are we trying to accomplish? If you wanna reach for or lean on the HUD definition or the United States Interagency Council on Homeless definition around homeless services for veterans, for you to get the credential or for any community in the United States to get the credential that they have ended veteran homelessness you need to be able to demonstrate to HUD that you no veteran who becomes homeless will be homeless for more than 30 days, ever. That your system can catch that really quickly. That has a very specific definition. And many of our homeless services in this part of the country are funded, particularly for veterans, are funded at the state and federal level, and the services are based at the county level, and we have some services in different parts of our portfolio at the municipal level here. Connecting those dots in a way that lets us speak to that effectively and honestly is an endeavor. We have to have those relationships and agreements to move between them. Um, based on ongoing needs assessment, again, can we measure whether we have a dynamic assessment process that constantly reassesses on a regular basis and documents that in a concrete way that lets us know that this is an outcome that we have. Yes. Transparent prioritization. How do we structure our decisions in a way that lets us be clear and lets everybody understand this is the way We've structured our eligibility criteria. This is the evidence for why we structured it in this way. These were many of the elements that came up in these conversations around outcome measurement. Looking forward. A reporting mechanism for all stakeholders. Folks wanted to have more, the way individuals framed it was more accessible communications in lots of rooms, feeling like they didn't have the time or the context to analyze spreadsheets or charts or different resources. They really wanted very clear, straightforward communications, if that was possible. Street smarts. This one came from one of our, our youth tables. 
Um, again, we can measure that. Street Smarts has lots of, lots of different definitions in the research, but one of the definitions is grit, which ties with another concept called non-cognitive skill development. And um, there's lots of great research out there if you're interested in this topic. I'm happy some of the team members in this room have heard me talk their ears off about this. There's lots of research. Um, uh, going back to the 60s, tracking a cohort from something called the Perry School Project. And the guy who did the analysis just won the, or not just, but a few years ago won the Nobel Prize for his research. And looking at how investments in non-cognitive skill development our ability to work as a team, our ability to solve problems, how long I can work on something I want to work on, which gets coded as time on task. These are measurable things. So if, if this was a decision that your community made to move forward, that one of the outcomes we want is this, measurable. Independence, independence has lots of definitions in lots of different forums. If this came, if this card was pulled out of a column from an elder conversation, I would frame it in one way. If this card was pulled out of a youth conversation, I would frame it in a different way. For the youth, it has a, the implications of establishing their own household, sustainable income, skill development, employability, all of those features for that developmental step for a household of elders, it has a different definition. It's about ensuring um, that social isolation doesn't happen, access to physician-compliant diets, um, trans uh, access to ad adaptive transportation. Um, all, uh, again, a whole different set. And so this simple one word, independence, has l multiple dimensions, and that's where our approach, we will talk about what that means and how, how we would measure that differently um, moving forward. Okay, so I said I was gonna ask you some questions. Get ready, and if you want to use Slido, did everybody, does everybody have Slido? You remember this? So go to slido.com. And N663 is the event. And I'm going to use this super unscientific, totally not valid methodology to just ask you guys, which of these do you want to hear more about? So we can use our report to, talk, to point and structure the conversation in different ways. Was there one of these that was particularly interesting to you, and do you want to know more about? N663. N, like Nancy, 663. And every time we use technology, there's always the opportunity for it to go completely wrong. So, so that's always a caveat. So again, the red were the activities and services. Those were the decisions about what things we do in human services. The blue was about skills and knowledge. And the green measuring the outcome. I'm gonna try to flip over without Um, you only get to pick one of those choices, yes. It structures you, and then you say, I think it says send or submit. Sent. There you go. Oh, look, it's working. That's so cool. <laughs> All right. 17 people voted. Skills and knowledge, not a hot topic or not a priority. And again, totally not scientific. <laughs> but... It, you already knew that? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. 20 people, 22 people. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. I, I worry I skewed it by saying that. Probably 
our scientists in the room would not agree that was a helpful thing to say, but it is interesting. And I think uh, the more information we have, the better off we are. I mean, is this what the room on Monday will answer? I don't know. I'll be interested to see how it varies. And I think our service practitioners would answer this different than our community leadership that would answer it different than our service participants. I'm a big fan of transparency. I like it. Okay. And now I'm going to endeavor to switch back over. That's what we just did. Okay. So now you may have noticed in the card structure this top row. This these were the headers of the column. And again, this is where the name, the naming convention came from the room. So this room had a column called Smart and Efficient Management. So a human service system looks like one that has smart, efficient management, prioritized, is prioritized and value driven, has inclusive and empathic access points, is, has community driven relationships, and layered and transparent accountability. So that was the way that this room answered this question. That's what an effective human service system looks like here. And again, we had this conversation many times with lots of different rooms, and each one came up with a different answer. I find these tremendously interesting, um, both the language choice and the structure and the focus. Um, we do carefully control the syntax. We ask adjective, adjective, noun for those headers, but they don't always, we don't always get that answer, but that's okay. Um, and so I put a couple of sentences together using those words to see, and, I'm, and again, I'm gonna ask you to vote on this in a few minutes, um, if these resonate for you. So, an effective human service system allows for smart, efficient management through layered and transparent accountability. It creates community-driven relationships and provides equitable, inclusive, empathic access to value-driven services. And again, all of this is online, so you're not missing it if you don't write it, write it down. Provides quality youth services, educational activities, and employment opportunities. Establishes and supports meaningful community relationships, like a family. Teaches life skills that support socializing and learning to be part of a team. Constantly improves services and clearly communicates to everyone the availability of those services. Deliver, delivers culturally competent, trauma-informed, low-barrier services that are aligned across sectors. I agree. Okay. <laughs> um, any questions about any of these so far? That one in particular has some jargony, uh, social worky words in it. Low barrier. Have folks in the room... I'll do an informal poll. Have folks heard that phrase before, low barrier? Just like raise your hand if you have. Okay, so we have a few that haven't. Low barrier design is the idea that you, you make your eligibility criteria only dependent on the things that are, germ are relevant to serving the person in front of you. So you try to get rid of any eligibility criteria that are irrelevant to the thing you're doing. And sometimes we social workers have a, a desire to grab onto as much of as many parts as we can. Um, but that sometimes creates eligibility criteria that are very complicated. Um, the hardest eligibility criteria I ever ran into was in uh, a community where you needed a letter from the sheriff in the county where you originally became homeless before they would let you into the homeless shelter. And I was like, I couldn't even tell you my sheriff's name, much less would he or she know who I am to give me a letter. Um, and so we firmly recommended they go ahead and get rid of that criteria. Um, provides strategic 
and equitable distribution of resources. Delivers safety and protection and ensures clean public amenities. I think this one was an interesting one too, like the housing answer. If we look at human services, if we're, so the, answer, the question that was asked, what does an effective human service system look like to you? And the answer that came back was about clean public amenities. And so how the community conceptualizes and reconciles is human services doing the thing it's meant to do kind of really does depend on what it's meant, how, how do we decide what it's meant to do? And is it fair or is it useful it's probably more helpful to, to hold that, that organization accountable for things that are specifically covered by other organizations. And I think these are the, this is the kind of clarity that we help hope to get out of this process. Ensures public accountability through data-driven, verifiable procedures. Targets programs that are client-centered and solution-focused. supports transparent, flexible administrative practices that ensure communication and collaboration. Some rooms wanted to support it, some rooms wanted to require it, some rooms encouraged. There was a lot of variation on that idea, but most rooms wanted some kind of community collaboration in their successful human service system. So, get ready to answer. We just gave you 12, 12. All right, now the blue doesn't look good either. I have to redo my whole color scheme here. Um, for our poll, choose three definitions of an effective human service system that worked for you. This is not, again, a scientific poll. This is not uh, a methodology that produces generalizable results that we're going to apply, but it does help our team to know what resonated for you. As you prioritize these, as you think of them, you're one more data point for us. You're one more kind of community engagement. We want, to, and I try to pull as much utility and value out of every interaction as I can. So I didn't want to lose this one. Yes. I probably can't answer it, but yes, you can definitely ask it. Are our answers like a light and the crowd's light? Are our answers like a light and the, I feel like only you can answer that question. Well, All right. Are our answers like a light in the crown of life? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to switch over. I'm going to try to switch over again. Let's see if this. So six people have voted. I kind of love the idea that I get the track. It will only let you do three. And again, this is not about we're going to exclude some or we're going to decide one is important or not. We don't really see ourselves as being the ones that are, are here to say what should or shouldn't happen. The, the purpose and what I said in every conversation we facilitated, our goal was understanding, not agreement. It was to understand each other's position. It was to better articulate what we were looking for when we talk about a human service system. The agreement part has to come later. Once we all understand what we're trying to do, we can have a, a reasonable negotiation or conversation around how to trade these things because we can't do everything. We're at our strongest as systems when we are targeting, when we're all working on the same thing in the same way together. Um, that's when we're our, at our strongest. And so that's the, this is the beginning of being able to arrive in that place is, is articulating our positions. How are we doing on voting? 24. All right. Is anything, any big surprises up here for anybody? Three more, so this question got, got three more. Yes. Uh-huh. 
So I don't know, and I'll give you folks who voted that one or didn't vote that one a moment to think about why. One of the reasons I might think about is that folks don't think about a human service system as being part of the mechanism that delivers safety. I know for some people they think about law enforcement or the EMTs or other components as being more closely tied to that idea of safety, but as, as many of us know, the, the idea of safety has both a physical component and an emotional component, and it's not only about whether I am safe or not, it's about whether I feel safe. And whether you feel safe is a significant part of, uh, of how you interact with the world. So I, I could see why some folks may prioritize it, and I can see why some may not. But did anybody, whoop, yes, we got a few in the room. We'll go here, and Satara is giving me the eye that I'm not quick enough oh, to get you. the mic. So here, <laughs> there, and then here. Speaking of feeling safe, yes. why isn't, I, I mean, I haven't seen any emergency preparedness. Um, communication here, like um, like I have no idea where to go, what to do mm -hmm. in case of uh, earthquake or, and many of my neighbors don't either. We've been talking about this mm -hmm. and uh, um, so. So as you think about a human service system, for you that idea of emergency preparedness is part of that vision? That's what I'm hearing in that question. Uh, it, it, so the emergent, there's an emergency management division I'm probably going to use the wrong language, but that's okay. There's, it doesn't live inside of this division. And so again, these are just decisions, and, and, I, and this is why I, we talk a lot about not looking backwards and reconciling and saying, oh my gosh, that, that's a terrible decision. People just made decisions on how to structure this stuff in different ways based on different needs at different moments. These may have been very reasonable decisions at the time that with new features to our community, a better understanding of our risk of fire, say, maybe we would want to reevaluate that decision with new information. Maybe we would. But it, it came up only in one out of 32 rooms was that discussion about emergency management. Uh, in the back there, yep. I, I'm actually super surprised that there's no no emphasis of the of two of the last three things, which is transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. um, where I thought those would be exceedingly important mm -hmm. um, as we have growing limited dollars and um, the number of people who we are serving um, is growing. So it, it seems to me that we have to have a way of measuring those kinds of things in order to be more transparent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, here and then here. Sir, do you still? Are the uh, quality of life in the ambassador centers in the same level? Um, I will have to get back to you on that. I don't know all the different components. Right. Perhaps. Would that fit for you? Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Was asking if the downtown ambassadors are within the human service division. So again, that will be something I'll have to give you an answer afterwards because I'll have to check with my team. We'll go here and then in the back there. Yep. Thank you. Veteran John Patrick Jewell III, Molaitha Khan. I, am, uh, I agree about the transparency. It's very interesting. It's very necessary. Um, however, the low barrier might be part of the challenge of getting that transparency because a lot of times transparency affects the uh, client of the service more than it does the provider of the service. And while the provider of the service is in charge of paying the bills, a lot of times they expect more transparency from the people that receive the service from the service providers and it can cause a, a drama or a, a chain of effects that kind of wipe out their uh, ability mm -hmm. to uh, really you. get service. Low barrier might be the step before transparency. But transparency is more important. Thank you very much. In the back there, yes. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad you, you will give you the last two questions then on this section. Thank you. Um, transparency. I read that as between the city of Santa Monica departments, not between 
the city and the served. Just a comment. Yeah. Because I think departments classically in many organizations don't talk to each other, have problems interfacing and all of that. And I see that through the Santa Monica Works mm -hmm. deal. Sometimes I'll get answers that say, oh, well, we can do that, but you need to call so-and-so for that. And I call them, and they direct me right back to Santa Monica <laughs> Works. Okay. And that is not cool. Yeah. Okay. My other question <laughs> was, um, are you part of the well-being surveys? I'm not. My team doesn't work on that. I actually, I come here from Cambridge, Massachusetts, just to do these parts. So the well-being is a long-term project that the city has really invested in over several years. Okay, just a comment is sometimes, you know how polls are. I do. They ask you one thing, like, do you want more parks? Well, yes. Do I want more places right. with tents in them? No. Right. How do you answer that? Yeah, Okay. that's a great point. And I think that's why um, I talk about this consensus building before we come to the part of the conversation where we start to negotiate what the array of services should look like. Because uh, going back to my example of the word independence, it means a very specific thing depending on who's saying it to whom. And it's easy to walk away from that conversation misunderstanding what you think you heard. Um, and and I, that was a perfect example of that. So thank you so much. I'll do one last question here and then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, in regards to human services and delivering safety, um, delivering safety and protection, there's a lot of people who are going through extreme loss because they're not receiving the benefits that the human services organizations are supposed to be distributing. And a lot of people are going through issues and incidents of crime victimization, which mm -hmm. is forcing them into destitute uh, living. And that's why I was asking about that question, delivering safety and protection and ensuring clean public amenities. So I think if you would like to contribute your thoughts to this yeah. conversation, I don't know if you had a chance to participate in one of our rooms. Yeah, I have. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. and we also have um, the poll open Yes. And the email address and a few other options. So I want to make sure that I, those are great contributions. I don't want to lose them from our yes, process. So yes. thank um, you. I'll touch base with you afterwards to make okay, sure you've got thank that. You. Yep. So what's next? We talked about where we began back to the beginning, the executive director meeting of that process. If you really want to go back with my team's work, you could go back 10 years. We've done a few projects here, but um, this project, the executive director in 2019, we have kind of this, this gap here. What are we doing with that gap? This is where we are piloting new outcomes. So we have worked with our team to develop three pilot outcomes to see if we can do this because it's hard. I don't want anybody to sit there thinking this is an easy thing. We talked about even transplant scientists at the beginning, transplant uh, surgeons at the beginning and how hard it is. Before I read that article, I was like, what do you mean you don't know what success is? You live or you don't live? But I came to understand the complexity afterwards. So part of our pilot outcome stage is to start to map out that complexity. But I wanna just touch quickly on output and outcome, and, and I'm gonna do it really fast before you all fall asleep. Um, an output is counting the things you do. So if you run a, a homeless shelter, one of your outputs that you almost have to count is what's called bed nights, which is the, night, the number of nights that a bed is, has somebody sleeping in it. So if I have 10 beds, I, and somebody's in every bed every night of the week, at the end of the week, I would have 70 bed nights. That would be the number of bed nights. That's an output. And it, outputs are different for every kind of program. If you ran um, a, a food pantry, your outputs might be the quantity of food that you served. Or if you delivered groceries, the, the poundage of food that you delivered. It's counting the things you can count. And it's very good from an accounting perspective, right? Like, how many, did you do the thing I paid you to do? 
yeah, I did. I did it this many times. But going back to our shelter example, if I told you a shelter had 70 bed nights, that doesn't give you any insight into how that shelter ended homelessness for the people who were in that bed. And that's the question that policymakers and funders are asking now. I don't know enough about your process here to know if that. Okay. Okay. So we're going to use these three pilot outcomes to try to map out how hard this is to do. So our first pilot outcome is to prevent the displacement of seniors from decent, affordable housing in Santa Monica. So my team, working with the team at HSD, is going to work to see if we can measure this. Because the outcome accrues at the household, the participant, the person who is receiving the services. What was the real world change in the participant's life that happened because of your service or that your service is intended to have that effect. And I am so thankful that I don't have a PhD and don't need to worry about regression analysis or fidelity scores or confidence intervals. We have lots of people who do that very rigorous analysis to prove statistically that things work. My focus is on how do we craft an intent? How do we say what we're trying to do in a way that lets us measure it effectively and then folks can the next stage of folks can have that conversation about the all of the statistic pieces our our second um, pilot outcome youth who receive quality mentoring and assertive case management support will achieve identified care plan goals so every word in each of these sentences has a very specific definition attached to it that we are now going to spend five months moving to see if we can acquire that data, if we can understand what's happening, and how these pieces fit together. The last one is participants that con participants consistently receive relevant services that lessen the frequency and duration of homelessness. So these are three ambitious goals to measure. And I just want to be super clear, these are pilots. We are here to learn about them. We want to understand how hard this is. This is scary for a service system to do, just so you all know that. Folks who do this work every day, this is scary for them as professionals, as organizations, as people to say, I'm accountable for uh, trying to accomplish this. And, and these are complicated, complicated tasks. And so I want to make, we're going to focus on this one for a few minutes just to make sure you understand the complexity, and then we're going to wrap up in about 15 minutes. Um, prevent the displacement of seniors from decent, affordable housing. So we want to learn what works, what's easy, and what's difficult. We know there's a health component to folks. We had a whole, con we had like a week long conversation around whether we needed the word involuntary before the word displacement or not, or if the word displacement always meant involuntary. And my team convinced me that it did, so we took that word out. But that idea that you can be displaced from your home can happen for lots of reasons. The choice, your volition, your desire to do that, some folks are ready. They, they make the decision to move into a different context of support based on their needs. For some, it's not a choice that they're making. And their resources are insufficient to meet the requirements of the community, to sustain their household in that community. So we're going to see what's easy, what works, and what's difficult about acquiring that. We're going to have to recalibrate these words, too. We, we may not be able to get the healthcare information that we need to measure this. There's lots of different laws 
around that information. We may not be able to connect it in a reasonable enough time frame that is fast enough so that we can be nimble in developing this goal. That's okay. We need to learn those challenges in order to overcome them as we move forward. And as I said, we want to assemble the data. We'll go here and then in the back. Um, we want to do the work of trying to assemble the data. Yes, your question. Uh, yes, with respect to uh, the one that's up right now. Yeah. Help me figure out how I would operationalize mm -hmm. that because I think there's a, an implicit comparison. Um, I will know that I have been prevented from being displaced if I, what, self-report that I thought I'd be displaced and I wasn't? Or how, how are we going to know sure. that individuals have been prevented from displacement? It's like proving a negative. It is like proving out. a negative. <laughs> and so when we get into that situation, looking at um, risk factors and protective factors and rates of displacement and rates of vulnerability. So we have lots of great data from lots of sources around the kinds of problems that cause individuals to become displaced. We know with a good degree of reliability those features in people's lives. It's about income, it's about health care. Um, for some populations, it's, as I said earlier, it's about access to food, it's about social isolation. And so looking at how we define that universe of individuals is going to be key to how we're able to speak to it. So I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen in the pilot. I can tell you that there are how we would measure their, uh, our ability to prevent would look at households that have those common features that often result in displacement and then how we measure the cohort as we engage with them and the types of services that we deploy. And it may be that we're not able to. That may be part of what we learn, that this construction is wrong. And I'm so excited for all the expertise that exists here in the city of Santa Monica. You have premier research institutions and amazing universities. And so I want everybody to contribute. So if there is specific feedback that you have or anyone has around how you would construct this differently, please share it. We definitely want to hear it. I know that wasn't a super satisfying answer, but it's the one I've got. Yes. How are you defining or measuring decent? So decent has a few definitions. And again, this is, a, this is about the, the decision that we make together, not there being a right decision. Um, we, could, we could pick uh, there's housing quality standard from HUD, which is a super rigorous, high threshold standard that you need to be certified by the federal government to apply to measure the standard. You have to be HQS certified as an inspector. There's a lower standard than that called habitability which is about you know the things in your apartment probably won't kill you. There's an even lower threshold that is like a, 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 a time-limited exception that can be made in a disaster. So there are lots of standards and, so, and lots of features. The HQS inspection has like 137 components to it. So I, I'm not in a position to go through all of them with you today, but that is part of the conversation that is happening through the pilot process. And affordable is as squishy a term. Affordable to whom? Based on what? Now? Later? Then? And what is, there is the National Alliance to End Homelessness produces a housing wage, which is the amount you would need to be paid on a, based on a 40 hour work week to sustain a one bedroom apartment in a jurisdiction, which is different from the fair market rent value that HUD assesses, which often lags significantly behind a community's actual rents. There's the deprivation, there are lots of standards. And so that, those are exactly the kinds of questions that we're engaged in as we move forward. Yep, uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it involves some of the organizations being extremely fragmented. I mean, some of them are supposed to be providing collaborative efforts to house people, sure. and they're not collaborative. 
Some of them are only doing statistical mm -hmm. uh, things. You know, they, they take the person's information, they do a massive intake of the person's information, and they don't house them. And these are people who are willing to pay the rental fees, they're willing to pay their utilities. Some of them may be disabled seniors. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is that, and especially with HUD and the housing authorities, is that they're running these websites that indicate they have availability, and then when these people actually go to these properties, these units are actually not available. So there's not a really good collaborative system that houses people, and it causes a repetitive displacement. We've seen it, some of us have experienced it, and we're even being asked, okay, how did you get your housing? Some of us are having to use multiple case managers. When one doesn't house us, we go to the other. Um, we're trying to make sure that we use long-term case managers who actually know our case because we get these new case managers who don't know our case and they delay everything. So it's like repetitive displacement. I really so yeah, we've that actually feedback. seen and experienced some of that as seniors and as disabled seniors, especially those of us who have worked and have careers. We're not gonna pause for questions because again, there's not so many people in this room that we need to do this. Um, so sorry, I, I'm gonna make the arrow flash less the next time I do this. Um, what is also important is that we not move in isolation. So some of these colors will be familiar. Um, some of these colors will be new. The Human Services Division exists within a context of the city of Santa Monica, and the city of Santa Monica has made significant investments in how it organizes its resources. And so it's important, just like we want our service providers to be coordinated, that we also coordinate. So what you're looking at here, and man, those colors are tough. Um, what you're looking at here is our team, my team's work. And it says at the bottom right and the top left, conceptual draft. <laughs> because I don't want anybody to get up out of this room thinking, this is the, like, we're done, we did it, here it is. This is the beginning. And what part of my question for you all is, is this helpful? So we're gonna walk through this for a second and talk about it, but if this doesn't help make what we're doing clearer and more understandable, then it's not doing the thing I need it to do. And that's why I'm coming to you with this question. And we're gonna look at this diagram of visualization, and then we're gonna look at another one. And then I'm gonna ask you to pick one that you like better. So start to get ready to render an opinion on Slido. So this in the middle is our outcome, prevent the displacement of seniors from decent affordable housing in Santa Monica. The next ring out from that are the organizations within the city that we know touch on that idea, that contribute to that. So this is not a comprehensive exhaustive list. This is a sample, a representative sample, not even really representative in that. It's an idea. <laughs> I'm asking you if it's a good idea. So in the top left, it says big blue bus. The bottom left, it says community and cultural services. And on the right, housing and economic development. The next ring out are the projects that those organizations fund or the services that they operate. So outside from Big Blue Bus is Mode, which is the um, uh, transportation for individuals who are elderly or disabled. Um, out from Housing and Economic Development is your very amazing POD program um, and the Housing Choice Voucher Program operated by the Public Housing Authority. And under Community and Cultural Services is Wise and Healthy Aging, the Senior Housing Task Force, and we just put a placeholder in for an eviction prevention program. And so the idea is that it, as we work with our pilot team, because again, this is, this is my team's thinking, and we need to check now if you guys like it, should we use this as the model, and then we will do the, spend the energy to make it, align it with reality. But I don't wanna go through all the work of aligning it with reality if you're gonna like the next one better. <laughs> um, so, and then the outer ring, for those of you who haven't seen these colors before, these line up with and are the same language of your city framework for a sustainable community. Because everything that we do 
with our municipal resources should be aligned with the municipal goals. And these are the goals that your community has established. So we should be able to understand how we're making decisions in relation to those goals. And so if we did this for every uh, goal, every one of our pilot outcomes, they would look different. Our youth outcome would have different organizations around the inner ring, different organizations around the middle, and would probably touch some of many of these, but maybe not mobility and access. I don't know, I'd have to talk with, with the experts in the room, um, of which I am not. But it would look different. But the idea is every outcome we would commit to would have clear traceability throughout the whole structure. And then as we engage with specific programs and projects, that we would look at it this way, that, oh man, and you can't see it. On, the out, on my screen, <laughs> you can see the grayed out rest of the circle. And the reason we did it that way was because I don't want us to ever lose the interdependence of the system. And so every time in our report and moving forward, if you all like it or and everybody in the universe likes it, um, we would stick with the, whatever graphical representation we use so that that could become part of the language that you use as you look at programs. So as you have a conversation at a program level, we should know exactly how it connects and what the other partners are. So we would pop out certain parts based on a particular conversation um, and then, and not in other conversations, depending on what we were working on. Uh, yes, here. And again, draft, 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 not, not real. <laughs> One element that I think is left off is food insecurity. There will be many elements that are okay. left off. I'm glad and, you said that. Though. And the, the reason I say that is that while there are home delivered meals and things like that, um, they, the, the socialization, et cetera, the, the tie from food insecurity or isolation, et cetera, need to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Again, this has not cleared the filters of the program experts who know all this stuff. This is just my team's um, initial knowledge of these things. Oh, we have gotten some questions. Okay, about this in particular or about any, everything? Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna quickly do the last two slides in my presentation. We'll do the last poll, and then I'm gonna do questions. And um, I will stay here for as long as anybody wants to talk to me. So we will have to wrap up because this is a hot commodity, this room in the community, which is great. The library was great to lend it to us. But I do wanna make sure that we have, we have plenty of time, I'm here, I'm here until Tuesday. Um, and so I will talk to anybody who wants to talk to me about these things, um, as some of you have discovered. <laughs> um, so the second version is just a different visualization. So the, the outcome statement is on the left. These are the organizations inside the city that touch that outcome directly. Again, sample, 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 not real, not real, not real. These are the projects, and these are the alignment with the um, frameworks. And I will say, I didn't love this from our design team until I saw this, and this I kind of loved, um, was the way it kind of popped out laterally. Um, it felt different to me. So I don't, I'm, it's not my decision. <laughs> um, it's two different representations. Some folks liked the circle because it gave you a sense of what 100% is, which I think could be a plus or a minus, depending on the conversation. Um, that a circle is generally perceived to be 100% of something and, and what that looks like. So, Slido, last poll, which diagram do you like better? Number one 
Or number two, non-scientific, lack of rigor in our methodology here, but I am curious. So go ahead and vote. And then we'll just quick look at that and then I will take questions. Um, and until they throw me out. Um, I can, there you go. That website, is that the website you meant? Or the Slido, the voting website? No, how we look at the Yes, it's this second one. This is not uploaded to the web yet because I wouldn't upload it till I presented it. Um, but it's the second website here is where it will live. Or there'll be a link through there. And I'll put this slide back up in a second. I'm just going to click over to our voting. Try and do this gracefully. Aw, oh, man, that's not helpful. <laughs> I wanted clarity from the room. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, all right, I'll take it. I'll take it. We'll see what happens on Monday. Oh, some late voters. Um, I'll quick log in and log my vote. Um, so we do want your suggestions, as I said. And these are the ways we can take your suggestions moving forward. And it's very important to me and my team in this work that we create records of everything so that it's clear where ideas came from and how they got processed. So, so I, I will talk to everybody as much as people want to talk. I will also encourage you to submit it in writing. Um, and here are three different ways you can do that. The first one is a survey monkey. Um, this is a survey instrument that we have had up online, um, gosh, for probably three months now, um, that was set up to be available to anybody who couldn't participate in one of our sessions. It's available in English and Spanish. Um, so if anybody wants to distribute that link, please feel free. Uh, the second one is the wearesantamonica.gov slash HSD project, which is our project here. Um, and so resources, there's um, a couple of other things up there, and it's, that's the main place we communicate about the project. So if you want to stay up to date, that's where you go to do it. And the last one is the email for my project team, at smgov.net. Um, just be aware that that goes to a group of people, so you're not communicating to me privately or individually. Um, again, I'm a huge fan of transparency and accountability, so it goes to a few folks to make sure that everybody can help answer it in case I'm on vacation uh, or somewhere else. So uh, with that in mind, I will say thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I hope it's been helpful. I'll look forward to your comments. And Chris, I'm going to stand here for as long as Chris is going to read off questions that he got. You should go if you need to go. And I'm going to look for somebody to give me the high sign that the library wants me out at some point. But we're going to stop our live streaming. Same great place. What is it? Same time? Same channel? Same channel? Oh, man, I don't remember. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you. My brother's here. He came to see me present because he lives out here. So a little family support there. All right, Chris. Oh, sure. Perfect. I forgot that that was the main line. Sorry.